So thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Alexander McLaren. I'm doing a PhD at Imperial College in the Tribology Group. And the subject of my PhD is electric vehicle transmissions. So um, I was talking to the presenters at Tribe UK recently, and sorry, the, the organizers, and I, I asked, so what shall I say? And they basically said, say something about yourself and say something interesting. So I'm gonna endeavor to do both. Um, if you are at Imperial and have heard some of this before, don't worry, I'm not gonna bang on. It's gonna be at quite a high level and hopefully um, include some stuff that even you guys haven't seen before. Awesome. Um, so just, just briefly about me, um, I did my undergrad at Imperial as well in mechanical engineering. And my master's thesis was on the saxophone um, on keywork ergonomics, and my bachelor's project was about bicycle transmissions. I also did a year in industry before my undergrad at Leonardo Company in Edinburgh, and I worked on electronics for environmental testing of radar. Um, and before that, I was at music school in Edinburgh. So I, I sort of have a background in engineering, and that is, that's who I am. Um, in terms of sort of where I'm going, I think that automotive tribology is an amazing topic, not only because the field of tribology touches lots of different fields, but also because there are so many interesting challenges in automotive. So I think um, today I will talk about some of those challenges and their relevance to electric vehicles. But really the phenomena that we study are inherently very interesting and very applicable more widely. I'm going to start with a brief overview of the things we need to think about when we want to test or model electric vehicle powertrain efficiency. I will then look at some work that I've been doing on new high speed load dependent loss phenomena. And then I will look at load independent losses measured in situ in an electric vehicle drive unit. I will also talk about some work that I've done bringing these together in situ, um, and so actually measuring full-scale drive unit efficiency. And um, yeah, those tests were, were scary. Um, and finally, I'm going to just touch a little bit on the coupling between efficiency and reliability, and the real need to optimise those in tandem. If you're going to make an electric car of the future, actually, what do you change and what do you have to consider so that these systems um, are both efficient and reliable and therefore have the best life cycle um, or the lowest life cycle carbon emissions? So just uh, for the avoidance of any confusion, by powertrain, I mean the entire journey that the power um, takes between the grid and the wheels of the electric car. And so that of course includes any charging infrastructure, um, both outside the car and inside it. You then have a high power inverter, a high power electric motor, and you have a gearbox. A gearbox is necessary in an electric car, contrary to popular belief, because if you want to optimize power density in a motor, in an electric car, chances are it's going to go quite a lot faster than the wheels need to go. Um, as a result, you usually do have a single speed gearbox, but it's quite a significant reduction. And actually, if you look at the sources of loss in these gearboxes, they are many and they are quite nuanced. The reason that this is worth studying is because um, about between 10 and 25% of the energy wasted in the powertrain is lost in the gearbox. And this is an area ripe for optimization because these gearboxes have not really been seen before in cars. We're used to manual transmissions, we're used to automatic transmissions, and we're used to those wasting energy to the tune of 6% of the overall powertrain loss. Whereas now we've got a much more significant chunk to optimize. So this is actually worth looking at. And of course, when we, when we ask what those losses are, um, we have losses from gears, bearings, and from seals, and we can categorize those in two ways. We can say, well, there are load dependent losses and there are load independent losses, which hopefully are self-explanatory. Gears and bearings um, contribute to both. Um, whereas if we change the power that goes through the gearbox, the seals don't see that change. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about these two types of loss. And I'm gonna look at some experiments that I have done at Imperial um, which elucidates some of the mechanisms behind these. So we have load dependent losses that are just as a result of elastohydrodynamic traction in gears. And of course, we often have boundary lubrication. We often have quite complex surface interactions and gears are geometrically and kinematically non-trivial. So um, actually studying these is not simple and modeling them uh, less still. We could, however, abstract 
RDO contacts to elastohydrodynamic contacts, where we understand the rolling siding conditions, although those change continuously. And we could use an EHD traction model to predict those. So that's what has been done in the past. Um, when it comes to load independent losses, we have even more difficulty because ultimately load independent losses in a gearbox predominate because of several quite complex fluid mechanical phenomena. So we have <clears throat> um, we have churning, we have windage, um, and we also have various trapping phenomena um, and some, some surface energy changes as well in the fluid itself. And modeling those is frankly a nightmare. Um, and so I have done some experiments which looks at those. So I'm going to start by talking about the left hand side of that previous slide, which is about load dependent loss. Um, and ultimately, one of the other challenges, I've just reeled off a list of uh, things that are difficult about these, but to add to that list, we have the fact that um, in these gearboxes, stuff goes really fast. And that is because the forward speed of your car when it's driving on the motorway, let's call it 75 miles an hour, uh, 70 miles an hour is the speed limit, sorry. The top speed of this car is 155 miles an hour. Um, at either of those forward speeds, and you have to design for both, we have really, really high entrainment speeds in our elastohydrodynamic contact. So we're looking at of the order 20 meters a second um, in both gears and bearings. And the thing is our models don't work at those speeds for several quite good reasons. By the way, the gearbox I did these calculations on is quite an old one. We expect these to multiply by one and a half again. So we expect motor speeds of between 25 and 30,000 RPM to start happening in the next decade. And that means that we'll really, really be in these high speed regimes much more of the time. And so you might ask the question, well, why is this important? Um, Usually, when we study elastohydrodynamic traction or indeed film thickness, we assume that the contact is isothermal. That is that, you know, the temperature field is approximately consistent so that although we have vast changes in pressure and viscosity, um, those aren't affected too much by temperature on the time scale of fluid flow through the contact. This is simply not true at these speeds. Um, and so we get extra um, funky behavior as a result of inlet shear heating, as a result of flash heating, um, because we have, you know, frictional sliding. And also just, I, I know elastohydronomic uh, traction tends to experience high shear rheology in any case, but we have really, really high shear rheology going on here. Um, and as a result, if we look at models, so this is the orange curve um, of, you know, what we expect film thickness, for example, to be, we expect log film thickness to be proportional to log speed. Um, that is true at low speeds. Um, almost all of our experiments on the MTM of the EHD are below four meters a second. If we look at where four meters a second lies on that graph, our fit's really good below that. You know, our rigs work. Above that, less so. And so the question is, well, um, how, how should we be taking into account these quite large discrepancies? Bear in mind, this is a log scale, so that's like a factor of two at the, the right-hand side of that graph by which this is wrong. Um, so I've done some work on something called the high-speed EHD, which is a new rig from PCS. It goes up to 20 meters a second, and the graph that you saw on the previous slide um, incorporated data from it. And this allows us to sort of probe a bit deeper into this high-speed regime without using ridiculous oil viscosities, and um, therefore to recreate some of the contact conditions that you might see in electric vehicles. I won't labor this point too much, um, Hopefully everybody in the room knows how the EHD works um, and it won't be necessary for the purposes of this talk to understand optical interferometry and all of its nuances. But basically I can measure film thickness and I can also measure traction. And traction is important. It's just the word we use for film, full film friction, but it's important because ultimately we can use traction to model how much we waste energy in the gear contacts and the bearing contacts in our gearbox. So load dependent losses require a robust understanding of traction in those contacts. I'm gonna skip straight to traction. Um, these are some traction curves that I've measured using that high-speed EHD. On the y-axis, um, so that's the axis that's just disappeared, is entrainment speed. On the x-axis is slide roll ratio. And so, you know, we expect these traction curves to, if we transformed to a shear stress, shear strain rate space, apply, uh, sorry, we expect them to obey approximately an earring type 
law. So we expect shear stress to be approximately the inverse sine of shear strain rate or the other way around. Um, and as a result, the function should be monotonic. It should keep increasing. And so if we look at this in traction coefficient versus slide wall ratio space, we expect these curves just to continue going up, follow the gradient to, to get less steep. Of course, this, this doesn't happen at high speeds. So if we look at the curves that are closer to us in this space, um, we see that we sort of get a plateau and then sometimes traction goes down a bit and we get weird behavior. And we also predict much, much higher traction coefficients than we actually see because there is so much in, the, in that shear heating that we actually have a different viscosity in contact. So I've done some measurements, I think, um, ones that traverse this space much more fully than any that have been done before. And I'm just going to share a couple of the results with you um, and then move on. I think the interest here is just the, the relevance to actually what this means for transmissions. So I'm going to focus on that. One thing you could say is, well, OK, how does this vary with contact pressure? Um, we don't expect it to be linear, and we don't necessarily expect it to be uh, easily predictable. The, the weird thing that happens is if you look at high speed and high sliding, and gears operate in high speed and high sliding conditions, because you might get 60% SRR quite easily, um, far from the pitch line, and it is uh, in those places where you get minimum build thickness, so that's important, you end up with a traction coefficient that doesn't really seem to depend very much on temperature and therefore viscosity that doesn't really seem to depend very much on contact pressure and seems to take the value for this fluid, which is um, just a base fluid. It's like a PA yeah, um, of approximately the same viscosity as an automatic transmission fluid might be. It's about 0 0.01, which is quite low. Now, so far, models of load independent loss have used the Johnson and Tavarvik earring model. And as a result, completely failed to resolve this quite wacky effect, which is our thermal um, our thermal transport of the fluid or our, our thermal transport of energy and momentum in that contact results in an effectively governed rather than um, rather than a, a static or kinematic uh, system, which means that we our attraction basically plateaus to a constant. Um, also these experiments suggest. So when we look at modeling these systems in the future, this is perhaps something we might want to take into account. We could also say, well, what is the effect of viscosity? Um, and I, I can decouple that from temperature by doing the same temperature matrix on two different fluids. These both have the same chemistry as an automatic transmission fluid uh, that's currently DEX16 certified, except we've massively changed the base fluid so that one is extremely viscous and has like 30 centistokes viscosity at 100 degrees, and the other is extremely in uh, not viscous, um, and so is much thinner than that fluid might be uh, in service. Again, about 0 0.01 at high speed and high sliding. Just, just something interesting there. I said also I would look at load independent loss. Um, and this, this is such an interesting phenomenon because ultimately you have loads and loads of things going on. So the question is how much energy do gears waste by species bashing oil around? Um, and what do we need to consider to answer that question? So we might consider how much the gears impinge on the sump, what the immersion depth of that gear is. We might also consider direction of rotation, which because it changes the steady state oil surface profile, massively changes how those gears see the oil and therefore the magnitude of the loss. We obviously intuitively will consider viscosity because shear and density because inertia, um, but less intuitively, it's, it has been found over the last two decades that vapor pressure of the fluid, wetting angle, liquid gas solubility are all really important in these phenomena. If you have a jet lubrication system, which you do, often in electric vehicle transmissions, then you jet velocity and volume flow rate matter. Your orientation of the, the gearbox, but also its casing geometry and like how do you parameterize casing geometry? Like it's usually extremely complex, um, really, really, really matter. And so this is why it's important doing tests in situ in actual gearboxes to work out what these ballpark numbers are, because ultimately people who model this stuff cannot resolve this without a full thermally coupled CFD model that can do EHL as well. And there is not one of those currently extant. Finally, um, just some basic parameters about how we design the gearbox. So not just speed and speed ratio, but also to the geometry, you know, classic uh, 
module number of teeth, and then the modification coefficient, all of this stuff affects how the gears will waste energy by this mode. And I have banged on about this for a whole slide because um, it's really, really significant, this, this loss. And as tribologists, what we're trying to do is optimize this so that ultimately in the future, we're not wasting huge amounts of energy just driving along the motorway. Um, my measurements suggest this is about 10% of the total gearbox loss. Um, and that means 10% of you, sorry, 10% of the total powertrain loss, that means 10% of your driving range has just been chopped off the battery just because of oil splashing around. And um, given that consumer range anxiety is such a significant concern, um, ultimately it's of interest to manufacturers to make sure that driving range is as long as possible. So an extra 10% would be welcome. I've measured this by um, designing a rig around a gearbox uh, and a drive unit from a popular electric vehicle currently on the road. When my supervisor first saw this slide, his reaction was, ah, you have labeled your spill tray. So I thanked him for his feedback. Um, but ultimately the rig spins up this gearbox with an external motor. The motor has been um, deactivated, the motor that would actually be in the drive unit. And then looking at the transient on that rundown is able to measure all of the torques, so that the sum of them inside the gearbox, and estimate its efficiency under no load. Um, I misspoke slightly there. Efficiency is not well defined under no load. And to estimate its no load losses, there we go. So the gearbox itself is typical. It's a classic um, sort of gearbox design where you, for an EV, where you have a single speed because the motor can supply torque over its entire speed range. Um, it's not a diva like an internal combustion engine, so it doesn't require that change gearbox. And then a two-stage helical reduction. There are other designs, and I'll talk briefly about that at the end. Um, but we have a reduction ratio here of about 10. This gearbox is relatively, I don't think I can hide that, can I? Um, is relatively nuanced in the way the oil flows around it. So at the top of the gearbox, um, I've put a blue rectangle around the lowest point. And there is an oil filter there where oil gets pulled in. It then gets sent through this little pump to a joint which splits the fluid flow. So some of the fluid is sprayed into the, the gear mesh and some of the fluid uh, continues on to a heat exchanger where it dumps heat into the car coolant loop. That coolant loop also cools the power electronics and the battery, etc. Finally, this is a wet motor design. So oil then gets sprayed directly onto the stator windings of the motor for cooling purposes. And so we have a very complex thermally coupled system here where um, the, the oil is doing several jobs at once. But of course, there's still the heat exchange with the um, coolant loop. And ultimately, people are trying to make this a single fluid in the future. So, you know, your, your oil starts doing even more and more jobs. And so we have this incredibly complex system, which we're trying to put more and more demands on the lubricant in. And um, I hopefully this illustrates that. So with this gearbox, I've just, as I said, spun it up to a really high speed, disconnected the drive uh, from the gearbox with a little electromagnetic uh, touch, and then recorded the speed transient. I can use Newton's second law and reinterpolate to find the deceleration as a function of uh, angular speed. And from that deceleration, I can refer all the inertias around one shaft and calculate the total torque. Um, I have measured the inertias of every rotating component really accurately. And if you want to know how I did that, you can ask me afterwards. Um, I then did the experiment with no oil in the gearbox. I say no oil, like, like a little bit of oil, like enough to make stuff not die. Um, and then, um, but no, no immersion depth. And then with several different immersion depths, and I'm plotting here excess torque, which is the difference between those. There is a slight limitation here in that obviously there's a, it's a multi-phase flow. So me removing one of the fluids doesn't remove the air in the gearbox. And so the interaction between air and oil is not necessarily resolved here, but nevertheless, it is realistic. Um, the upshot of these experiments, if I then plot power on the vertical axis instead of torque, is that we ultimately have several hundred watts of power just being dissipated to heat via viscosity um, at the full immersion, which is you know that, that top curve is the full fill for this Dex16 transmission fluid. 
Um, the one shipped in the car is the grey dotted line and is slightly less viscous than this, but that manufacturer has been fiddling with the viscosity of that fluid for a while because they've got lots of failures. So the question is, of course, what viscosity uh, and what fill level should we have? Earlier, uh, Dr. Professor Ian Taylor, I'm really sorry, I don't know your title, um, said that we might have or we might expect to have a drive unit oil change in an electric vehicle of five years. Actually, more and more, they're filled for life. That means much more than five years. So we need additive chemistries and oil fill volumes that have enough additives in to last for that time. And that is really tricky. We also have to have the fluids that are sufficiently shear stable at these high speeds. And so there is quite a bit of formulation effort going into um, you know, these fluids for several reasons, that being one as well. So I've measured some stuff very offline in a rig that looks at elastohydrodynamic traction. I've measured stuff in situ, but without putting any power through the gearbox. And to bring those together, it's necessary to actually look at gearbox efficiency under road realistic conditions. So I did this using this very scary rig, which can circulate half a megawatt of mechanical power. Um, the way it does this is asking the drive unit to drive the car as if it were in the car. And then um, via two dynos, one to represent each wheel, putting a known torque or speed controlling the output. Um, and so I could control the accelerator of the car effectively here with um, a big lab view setup. And so I did that and I first measured load independent loss. So without the drive unit powered and I was you know, spinning the gearbox backwards in terms of the, the power flow, but kinematically it was equivalent. And then I looked at you know, the, the whole shebang, just everything, what, um, what the actual efficiency of the gearbox would be. So in terms of my load independent loss measurements, they're quite similar to the curve that you saw on, um, on the smaller rig. And I did it for two oils. And you see not only um, are my losses really quite different between these two oils, and so there is a, a strong dependence on oil viscosity here, um, and that dependence is quite complex, as you would see if you read uh, a really good paper by my colleague Joe Shaw. Um, you are welcome to send me an email afterwards if you, um, and I will, I will connect you with him because um, the viscosity of the transmission fluid has been found in that paper to not produce a monotonic loss response. That is to say, if you increase viscosity, losses don't necessarily increase. This is both controversial, but also deeply important if we are to try and optimize viscosity in these gearboxes. Um, but in this case, when you increase viscosity, losses do increase. But also the hysteresis, there are two repeats here, but I've gone up and then I've gone down again in speed. And so you see like slightly hysteretic behavior, which is as a result of temperature change in the gearbox. And of course that temperature change increases as viscosity does too, because of your power dissipation. You also um, see a change in efficiency. So this is a full efficiency map of that gearbox um, over about half its total torque um, I've, I've done the full one, I just have zoomed into this one, um, and it's full speed range. And you see that actually, you know, although we predict 80, 90% efficiency, if we look at the torques that we tend to exert while we're driving, which are definitely less than 50 Newton meters most of the time, this gearbox is massively overpowered. And um, for everyday driving, it's, you know, it's one of these cars that's peppy when you, when you want it. Um, but also, it's not 90%. Our efficiency at 50 newton meters is like 60, 70. Now this measurement was not flawless. So I would accept an error here of maybe plus or minus four or 5% inefficiency. But even within the, that tolerance, we're not looking at the efficiencies that we predict. So I think this is also significant. Um, one other thing we could do just because, you know, um, for fun was um, put the new European drive cycle through this, this rig. So we had two dynos and we could program them and we had the, the drive. Um, and so my colleague Joe gave me a drive cycle, um, which, you know, is this one that's representative. And I programmed the rig to do this. Um, the upshot of this slide, I would like to be that cyan curve on the bottom graph, which says that efficiency, even for this drive cycle, sits about 80, 85% um, a lot of the time. And we would predict five or 10% higher than that quite a lot 
um, from yeah for most of these gearboxes. One thing I will finally um, also highlight is that the contact conditions in these gearboxes are relatively aggressive. We have gigapascal or potentially above contact pressures. I know some manufacturers have tried to design for two gigapascals and then um, Eaton Humble Pie quite significantly when they, they discovered the impact of that. But also um, we have lambda ratios less than less than 0.8. And of course, you know, we're very far into the boundary regime when you start doing your acceleration. But of course, that is the point at which the motor can supply most torque. It's that when you first hit the accelerator, your motor has a massive stall torque. And so ultimately, um, requiring these gearboxes to dissipate very little energy at high speed, while also protecting the surfaces from gross damage at low speeds, is really difficult. And current additive chemistries struggle to do this. So I'm going to look at what the effect of current additive chemistries is on a particular damage mode that is very prevalent in, in gearboxes. Um, next. I used a micro pitting rig to do this. So um, ultimately, one thing we're worried about in very high speed transmissions is high cycle fatigue. And fatigue results in you know, gross material ablation and um, as a result, initially horrendous noise vibration and harshness issues, but ultimately catastrophic failure, which we don't really want. Um, and so one of the, the things worth studying here is, well, how does the fluid chemistry impact this? Because additives in um, additives that are used for anti-wear can actually be deleterious to fatigue life by preserving the asperities. Um, as a result of that, your cyclic plastic asperity stresses are of greater magnitude. And those stresses that get locked in act as stress concentrators and ultimately result in a crack network that grows and becomes a serious problem. Fatigue is often the one that we see if we've got everything else right. So before that, you might see scuffing or, or massive wear, but ultimately, um, this is an interesting phenomenon that separates different fluid chemistries. So I've just uh, taken this little roller specimen. I've spun it between these three discs that you saw on the previous slide, um, and I've measured how much material we lost. And um, when I did this, if you, if you look at um, five different fluids that I measured, you actually see a very significant difference between them. I mentioned cooling performance earlier, and one of the things that people are trying to do is increase the thermal conductivity of the fluid. Um, and so people have been talking for ages about water, water in oil emulsions, water glycol. Um, and so this is a water glycol based fluid. Um, what people don't tend to talk about is the massive corrosive wear that you get, even with quite significant anti, um, anti wear and um, corrosion inhibitor additives. So this, this fluid was formulated to try and avoid this, but didn't manage. Um, this is a gear oil sort of thing you might see in a manual transmission. And this is an automatic transmission fluid, the sort of thing you would see in an electric vehicle currently on the road today, possibly minus a couple of the friction modifiers that are used for clutches, or possibly not. And this is the base fluid of that automatic transmission fluid. And then finally, we have um, a base fluid with absolutely no additives at all. So there's, a, um, there's one nester that's been left in this one. And, and so what you see is, you know, we haven't got the ad pack right to optimize for this failure mode yet. Now, these are quite aggressive conditions, you know, um, 11 million cycles at 1.4 gigapascals at 0.4 lambda is a very accelerated test. But when this manufacturer was seeing the noise vibration and harshness issue and had to up the viscosity to up the lambda ratio of, of their fluid, I suspect a mode like this was what they were seeing. Um, and if we look throughout the test at all of those fluids um, and how they evolved, we, we see the same story. So the question is, well, given all of this stuff that's a bit eclectic, what does it actually say holistically about where gearbox turbology in electric vehicles is going. Um, so I think that some of the important future work that will happen in this field, um, some of which I'm doing and some of which I'm very much not, is um, looking at reformulating these fluids and taking, taking a, a seriously holistic look at the effect of those formulations. So not just viscosity and not using assumptions that viscosity has a monotonic effect. Um, but also at, at sulfur 
free or at least copper compatible anti-wear additives if you're going to start filling something that's got a motor in it with oil um, and using the oil to cool the motor it's got to not corrode the copper and that's a massive issue for the industry at the moment so the additives that are used at the moment perhaps won't be so much soon um gearbox architecture is a fascinating one and one that is several phds in itself to look at as i said currently single speed two-stage helical reducer people are using planetary systems um people are using more than one planetary system people are using two speed transmissions and ultimately uh, all of those have a significant effect on loss and we're really not sure which is best at the moment this has been true for years but we're we're still looking at it the other really interesting one is could you get rid of the gearbox could you change your motor design and axial flux machines are one answer to this problem because they they go at slightly lower speeds and they have slightly higher torques but they're really difficult to make at the moment uh, especially en masse and so the future of ev gearbox tribology might really change if a different motor design was adopted but we're a way off that as i understand it at the moment um and finally how do you bring all this together what are you doing about cooling? Are you using the same fluid to lubricate the gearbox and cool the battery, or are you not? Um, are you using a system which has five motors in it or one? And ultimately, how do those things interrelate? So I think further work in the field of EVs will be primarily in some of these spaces. In conclusion, I found a funky thing about elastohydrodynamic film thickness and traction at high speed and high sliding. Gearbox efficiency depends on a lot of things and requires optimization in tandem with reliability. Otherwise, we will continue to get serious gearbox failures in these vehicles, which will continue to make the market less attractive, which currently, given the regulatory upward gradient, is not what we need. And lastly, we rely on new technologies in terms of fluid formulation, in terms of cooling systems, and in terms of gearbox architecture in the future, if we are to optimise both for efficiency and reliability. Thank you so much. Um, I think I have time for one question, maybe? Maybe a really quick one. Yeah. Very quickly, we can talk about cooling. Um, this is just based on something I've been observing about in the past the last few years. Um, I looked at a video which is talking about three rising cars in China and how they're exploding these fireballs. Um, so, this is something that's not been spoken about much in the EV car industry, where they just like your phone with this explosion, so the heat's too much. Have there been any research looking at? Why these three riders in the three Tesla cars are just turning to muscle fibers. Okay. How you know, cooling wires, um, is it oil? Is it electric? Is it the composition of the lithium battery? What is it? Question for you What is the most explosive element in an electric vehicle? Um, and my understanding is that, you know, if, if you hit an electric vehicle with a hammer, the bit that is going to explode when you hit it is the battery. So ultimately, if there are cars that are going into fireballs, um, which I have no doubt there are, um, given what happens to smartphones, that is an issue with battery technology and an issue with um, the safety in the battery management system. That is a field that, although it has tribological elements, is quite far from my research. So I will say nothing more about that other than that I'm sure people are working on this because it costs lives, um, but also that battery technology is one of the really hot topics in electric vehicles for many reasons, not just for safety. And therefore, I expect that will continue to change. So anything we say now might not be true in five years. Um, is it diesel that's the oil that's used in, in the engine, would say, or is it some other source? Oh, Lord. Um, so diesel is a fuel. The oil is usually um, some sort of mineral oil, which are long-chain hydrocarbons that are more less volatile than diesel. Um, there is not an engine in an electric vehicle, there is a motor. And as a result, the motor does require lubrication, but sometimes isn't oil lubricated. Um, and therefore, the oil that I'm talking about is just gearbox oil. Okay. Thanks very much.
Thank you. No worries. <laughs> so everyone feel free to uh...